Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm reckoning that a lot of people are still making their way from there to here, but because we have a full program, uh, we're going to make a start, and those that are late will be late. We have, uh, or I, I can use a, a, a skiing parlon. We're going off piste for a few moments uh, because uh, our Ukrainian guests have kindly given a few minutes of their time to tell us what has been happening in their country. And to do that, I'm calling on Mikola Gordychuk, who is vice president of the Ukrainian Potato Federation. Uh, and uh, Mikola has a few slides just to give us the background to what's happening uh, in his country. Mikola, please. whether you have to use that or not. But. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good evening, uh, distinguished delegates. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight on behalf of Ukrainian uh, Association of Potato Growers, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, my company, and on behalf of Ukraine, I would like to thank you for the invitation, especially to Irish Potato Federation, for uh, arranging this visit for us to this uh, great venue where I have a chance to see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues from various countries of the world. Today I would like to share with you a little bit about what's happening in our country and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the crisis that we are facing, food crisis that we are facing due to uh, war that Russia started in February with Ukraine, speak a little bit about my farm and uh, also challenges that this war brought to farmers and uh, update you about what we are doing to assist civilians during war in Ukraine. Ukraine is indeed an agricultural country and um, if you, many of you know a little bit about Ukraine that it's been a breadbasket for Europe but also every fifth worker in Ukraine works in agriculture. 26 of Ukraine biggest enterprises are agriculture enterprises. So if you look today uh, at Ukraine, Ukraine is a big player when it comes not only to potatoes. In potatoes, we, no we are number four in the world when it comes to area and production. But we are also big in winter wheat, sunflowers, uh, maize, corn, soybeans, rapeseed throughout the world. So how much does Ukraine produce of potatoes, what is the area? And uh, you would be surprised, it's over one million hectares. It's quite a big country if you compare it to, uh, to the rest of the world. And potatoes is a very important crop to Ukrainians and many people are involved in potato production in Ukraine. However, this one million hectares are distributed among small private gardeners. So the professional production in Ukraine is just uh, between 55 to 60,000 hectares, only 5% of that 1 million. And you would ask yourself, okay, but uh, what, is, what is the processing of it, or what is the retail market of this? And um, among those 60,000 hectares, we, pro we produce potatoes for crisps, potatoes for starch, and also for retail. Uh, processing only is 6% of total professional production of potatoes. If you compare it to Netherlands or Belgium or France, where you have 92 or 80 percent of processing potatoes, well, in Ukraine it's vice versa. We have 90 percent of potatoes for retail or for fresh consumption and only uh, five, six percent for processing. So for those who are interested in breeding and varieties, Ukraine has in total about 180 varieties in the register and out of them about 100 100, 106 varieties are from foreign companies, from Netherlands, from Germany, from Poland, from France, uh, from Scotland, and uh, from Ireland. And 74 uh, varieties are from Ukrainian Institute of Potato Research or small private breeding companies in Ukraine. What is my company doing and what is my uh, position in Ukraine? I started as an agent for Ahriko, a Dutch cooperative in Ukraine in 2005. In 2007, I started a company and our main business was in growing seed and table potatoes for seed potatoes for Ukrainian market and table potatoes 
for retailers like Metro Cash and Carry, Oshan, and other chains we have in Ukraine. I grow, my farm is 450 hectares. It's located in northeast of Kyiv, in Kyiv and Chernihiv area. And what we do, just the same what Irish farmers are doing, we plant potatoes, we spray potatoes, we harvest potatoes and we sell potatoes. So we, uh, I feel very much at home here at this Congress speaking to all the delegates and all the companies that we are, we are speaking the same language. And it's a great privilege for me to be here today. This is our harvesting time uh, of last year. And uh, we have quite light soils, very sandy. Unfortunately, on uh, February 24th, 5.30 in the morning, I woke, up, I woke up in my apartment in Kyiv due to shelling outside. And that was the time when the war started. And uh, it was completely unprovoked. And many of, you, uh, many of you know that this war started before, in 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea and Donetsk region. And this war, unfortunately, created a lot of human humanitarian crisis. Today, we have about over 10 million people who has been displaced from their homes and many of them went to Western Europe. I heard many, Ukrainian, many Ukrainians here in Ireland. I could hear people speaking Ukrainian on the streets. Uh, a lot of people went to Poland, over three million people. Many people are in Germany, Romania, France, Italy. And of course, this will be a great catastrophe to our country, but also it would be very difficult for Western Europe to maintain so, much, so many refugees. I think it's the first time such a big displacement of people after the Second World War in the history. In general, losses from the war already more than 600 billion to Ukraine, economic losses, including damage of infrastructure, uh, losses of civilians, losses of enterprises and organizations, and losses uh, of the state budget. But I'm here to talk more about farmers. And when we speak about farmers, when I came back to my farm, my farm was occupied for over one month. Russian soldiers were living on the farm. When they left, they stole instruments, tools, welding machine, diesel we had for planting. So I was able to get back on 4th of April. What do we see in Ukraine and what, what, what did we face for planting, before planting period? Uh, we had difficulties with getting fertilizer, no crop protection chemicals. We had difficulties with getting seeds due to logistics. As you all know, a lot of Bridges were burned, a lot of uh, highways were destroyed. Just to give you a short understanding of what has been happening on the way to my farm, beginning of April. You can see farm in Chernigiv area, area my, neighbor, my neighbor's farm, farm in Kiev area. A lot of machinery, agricultural machinery has been destroyed. And it's unbelievable to see that because of a fantasy of one man, this can be happening in 21st century. When I came to my farm, first thing we had to do is to clean our fields. You see those rockets. Those rockets were in my fields of winter wheat. And it took us about two weeks to clean the fields from these uh, rocket fragments. We got about two trailers of rockets, which we have carried out from our 100 hectare field before being able to prepare soil and start planting potatoes. Of course, many farmers were late this season with planting potatoes, with uh, sowing barley, uh, sunflowers, and other crops. And this will definitely lead in the future in, as a consequence to food shortages. But the biggest shortage we have today is uh, that the Black Sea ports are blocked completely. Ukraine currently has more than 25 million tons of various cereals, including maize, uh, soybeans, winter wheat, corn, but farmers cannot sell it simply because logistics are broken and all these cereals should have gone through the Black Sea port to the rest of the uh, world, mainly North African countries. About 400 million people will suffer this year, uh, this year already because of the deficit of cereals from Ukraine. Ukraine has been one of the major suppliers of sunflower oil. And many of you already saw in, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in France, the lack of sunflower oil or a prices of four four euro per bottle of sunflower oil. That's because this war will have greater consequences than, than we think. Just like speakers previously, yesterday I heard 
we're speaking about a famine in Ireland, which happened in 1845. For next four years, the country has been devastated. For next four years, people were leaving the country to Canada, United States, elsewhere, or dying of hunger because one year of famine. I'm afraid this war in Ukraine, even if it ended tomorrow, will have great consequences for years to come. What do we do to help people? Many civilians are suffering. Together with our association of potato growers, with Dutch uh, support and support of farmers from Poland, we organized an initiative where we give away seed potatoes. We believe that we don't give bread, but we have to give the fish pool, you know, to, to catch the fish. So we give people seed potatoes they can plant, and every household can plant additional uh, 100 kilos of seeds so they can feed themselves next season, but also a neighbor, a neighbor who has been displaced from Kharkiv, Mariupol, Zaporozhye, or Kherson area. And we have given away more than 600 tons of seed potatoes uh, to various regions of Ukraine. Why I'm here today, first of all, to thank you. To thank you for the support. We have received a great support from all over the world. But first of all, of course, to Irish Potato Federation for supporting Ukraine and supporting me and Victoria at this uh, venue, for being able to share with you and inform you about Russian aggression in Ukraine that happened this February. And I would like to say also that the war is not over yet. I know that many people are tired of war. Many people don't want to hear about war. But we are fighting not for Ukraine. We are in our territory. We are in our land. And we are fighting for the values, for democracy. And we want to be free. And this is something that Russia doesn't understand. And um, so I'm here to ask you, keep supporting. Please stand with Ukraine. And you see this fantastic picture I have taken. Actually, not me, but a friend of mine shared with me. The guy is eating chips. <laughs> it's produced in Ukraine. It's Mondelez. And every 10th package has a potato variety called Arsenal. So uh, there is still time for potatoes, even during war. And I would like to thank you very much for your support and for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who weren't in for the introduction, that was Mykola Gordychuk, who is Vice President of the Ukrainian Potato Federation, uh, who agreed to give us just a small feel for what has been happening in his country. Uh, Mykola, thank you very much, and I hope I did not get the pronunciation of your name too incorrect. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, we, we, we have two... Uh, presentations in this session, then followed by an interview with a real consumer, the person who eats for fuel. Uh, and uh, that's just something different for the program. But now I'm going to call on Lauren Scott to give a presentation on the, uh, her insights on fresh produce consumption trends around the world. And Lauren is from the International Fresh Produce Association in the USA. Lauren. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was very nice to be here. So to give you some context, I'm from the International Fresh Produce Association. If you hadn't heard of it, that's OK, because we just started this year. We formed from the Produce Marketing Association and another association in the United States came together to form this organization. And our vision is to create a vibrant future for all and all of us are the people in this room as well as the world. We have seven key strategic commitments, including advocacy in the United States and around the world, supply chain connection. But what I want to focus on with everyone here today is around demand creation. And what demand creation is, is how do we grow sales by connecting and understanding consumers and the marketplace? So, um, Liam, I don't know if you're here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I saw Peter, who uh, suggested that I come here. I've, I've really enjoyed myself, and I've learned a lot. And I'm thankful to be here. But probably more importantly, 
I'm grateful to be here. Because we have really gone through a lot in the last two and a half years. And what we've heard from our friend, we're still going through a lot. And it sounds like maybe four years, five years, six years. So that experience that we've all had, that's what consumers had. And I would be remiss to not be grateful to be here because I know so many people didn't have that opportunity. I also want to give a shout out, as they say in America, to whoever came up with this changing world theme, however many years ago, three years ago, because that really hit the nail on the head, and, and how do they know it? It's about the changing world. So think about the supply chain. There's people here all across the supply chain. You go and you look at the stands. Think of the experience of every single person. So if I'm a developer and I'm giving inputs, the innovation that I thought was going to come eight years from now, people are asking for today. A grower, it's not like it was the easiest job before. It's not like labor was just at your doorstep. I mean, how, I mean it's beyond tight. Every place we go around the world, every member we speak to, it's the constraint on labor. Labor in the fields, labor in the office. And I'll give some context of why that's happening later in the presentation, and costs. Just a couple hours ago, we saw that cost of oil is going up again. And you just can't get ahead of it. Every single input continues to rise. If you're a producer, a packer, how much volume is coming in? How much needs to go out? Who's coming into the office? Because people have gotten sick and forget about the transportation. Trucks lined up, waiting, queuing to go through. And for some commodities, rotting. Rotting. All that work for it to just rot. And then the retailer. The front line, trying to make the consumers happy as they have less money to spend in their pockets. But their expectations only continue to rise. But despite all of that, Everything that we do is for this person, the consumer. And remember when I said that the IFPA, or IFPA, depending on how you like to pronounce it, we accept both, is to create a vibrant future for all. Because we believe that eating fruits and vegetables is the single simplest thing that people can do to live a full and vibrant life. But the world is not eating enough in many places. And it comes down to two things. One is lack of access, where people don't have enough, where they don't have access to the food in their retail establishments. And we've got to get to a place where people are not starving. Like you said, in the 21st century, it's almost unconscionable that people don't have enough to eat. But there's a second reason why people don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, and we call that lack of consideration that people have the money, they have the knowledge, and they still don't eat enough. So there's a lot of research out about produce. And so we decided to field a, a study to understand what are people's attitudes. And we fielded it in a couple of countries. So the, one of the questions was, how important are fruits and vegetables in your lifestyle? Because it's sure people aren't eating enough, but if they don't care, then we've got a, it's a whole other issue. But the good news, my hope in humanity is restored, very high appreciation for fruits and vegetables. 94% in Brazil, 93% in China, even the United States, you know, the, the burger capital of the world, you could say, 83%. People know that fruits and vegetables are important in their life. So that's thumbs up. So then the next question is, well, how confident that you're eating enough fruits and vegetables? And that's where it got a little shaky. I mean, it's just like, nosedive, we're in the 20s. 29%, even in China, with such a high 93% in the diet that has so much produce, people's confidence level is 76%. So you can look at this or get depressed, but I'm actually an optimist. And I said, you know what that delta is between people understanding the importance and how much they're eating? That's opportunity. That's the opportunity to get more produce, more potatoes on the end of the fork to help to drive consumption. Because remember, health 
is not only about health, it's about living the full and vibrant life, a free life, a life that people can connect with their family and enjoy fully, full of disease, full of worry, full of, uh, free of, excuse me, free of disease, free of worry, and free of anguish. That was the Freudian slip there. <laughs> so that's the changing world that we want to see, where people can live that full and vibrant life with enough produce. So obviously I know that produce is good for you. I obviously eat produce. And so I started to take a course at Cornell, an e-course, to understand physiologically what food does to the body. So as any good student would do, I got my notebook and my pens. I mean, I'm sitting at the kitchen table, but that's OK. I still was in the mindset of being a student. And within the first five minutes of the course, the professor said this, and I'll quote, mammals have been uniquely successful in defending themselves against the harsh environment which we find ourselves. The harsh environment in which we find ourselves. Now I'm sure when he wrote this a couple of years ago, he was thinking about the cave men and women and children. But think about the harsh environment that we in this room find ourselves. Going into the grocery store, no matter what country you're in, empty shelves of food, not just stuff that's on sale, food that's always there. Your medical professionals wrapped in protective clothing, people buying masks and gloves and spraying Windex on all kinds of things, being afraid, truly, truly afraid. Being locked in your house, and it could go one of two ways. You either had too many people in the house, or you didn't have enough people in the house, but not being able to have the freedom to move and seeing safe, safe, safe signs in windows. And the pressure continues with fuel, not only in our businesses, but at the gas pumps for every day, and war, which we've just heard about. I was reading my email last week, and I came across this that came in, in front of me, and it, it made me stop right here. The cover of The Economist magazine, and it says, the coming food catastrophe. And we just heard the commentary, and I appreciate you giving us some context behind that. If you haven't seen this picture, this is supposed to depict wheat, but there's skulls in this picture. Skulls. And so I'm in the food business, so of course I need to think about it. And I'm coming here, and I said, for people in this room, in the potato industry, you're right in the thick of this. It's not something that's happening over there. You're in the food industry, huge, number three product that people consume around the world, one of the top produced agricultural products. So this is now your catastrophe here in the room. So I click on the article, and I see in the cover, you know they tag different articles, war and farming. War and farming. Never did I think that I was going to see those two words in the same phrase. And you know why it's horrible? It's because what we do, remember that supply chain? It's for people. It's for the people that want and need to live a full and vibrant life, and they're depending on us to do that. So remember, as you go through the day, people cannot be forgotten. Real people cannot be forgotten. And we in this room have a huge responsibility to the world because life is in our hands. You heard him say it. The threat of people starving is real. Not project it, but real. And so the, what you do today and the decisions you make and the conversations you have will have huge impact on the world. But we also know that people don't just eat to sustain life. They eat for different reasons. And we did some research a couple of years ago to say, why do people actually eat food? And we called it a taxonomy of food association. It was a, if anybody has done marketing research, it's like a 176 page deck and you get one slide. And uh, we're happy with the slide that we got here. So the taxonomy of food association identified seven key areas of why eat, people eat food. So one area is health. People eat because they want to be healthy. But it's more than that. 
They want something that's dependable. Think about, you've talked about that a couple of times, of how do you make sure you have the right seed potatoes so you have the right crops so you can get it into the retail? Because that's how people start to buy habitually. Some food is revitalizing. Think of fruit. Some food is very rich. Think of the fat in an avocado. That delivers on the richness that people are craving. Some people want a very a specific flavor pro profile. They're trying to fill a specific emotional state. I know there's some chocolate lovers out there that that helps to fulfill. But the one that's most interesting is popular and in the know. That means, is your product trending? Do people want to be seen eating it? That's the seven areas of the taxonomy. And probably a food of all the produce items, the potato is the one that delivers against all those areas of the taxonomy in an incredible way and does it very humbly and very hot all around the world. So in this changing world, we need to make sure that the potato provides sustenance, but also we continue to give joy to fulfill the reasons why people eat food. I now want to share with you a couple of global consumer trends. If you have an opportunity to go to Euromonitor International to their website, they have a free report that they do each year that sum up the top 10 trends. And I'm going to hit on a couple that are most relevant for us here. So the first is called the Great Life Refresh. So remember when we talked back in about labor early in the presentation. What you had happening at this time is that there were people who were in cities that said, well, now that I can work from home, I'm going to move anywhere. There was a person I knew, he, he went to Hawaii. There's people in the suburbs, okay, I'm gonna go closer to my mom. People started to have the flexibility to, be move, around, to move around if they didn't have to go into an office. And at the same time, people are not just moving, they're starting to reflect on their life. What are the values that are important to me? What are the needs of my family? Now that I've gotten beyond just being scared, what is the life that I want to live? And you may have heard the term the great resignation, where so many people have decided to quit their jobs and start fresh. Now, I will tell you that there's statistics out there that 68% of people who have left their job have buyer's remorse. So if you've hired some people in the last couple of years, tend to them. If the people that you had before are still in your organization and have not left, tend to them. Workplace is critically important now because even if people are not leaving your organization, they're seeing people around them leaving and they're going through this process of evaluating what their values are. I have a family friend in New York City, was never leaving New York City. If you know any New Yorkers, they never wanna leave. She had that apartment, but once COVID hit, she and her husband, those three kids and those two dogs, she had to go. She had to go to the suburbs. And that's what you're seeing a lot around the world. Similarly, there's a trend called self-love seekers. So this is about, okay, I've moved, I've got myself refreshed and reset. What is it that I need to be healthy? Not just the food that I'm eating, and there's a trend of people looking at the food they're eating, their supplements, what they're drinking, but also mental health and well-being. Mental health and well-being took a, to skyrocket it in people having concerns and issues. This is real. This is not manifested. And there's people in your lives and people in your companies that are going through this. So please do everything you can to support them on their journey. Because this is what consumers are looking for now, to take care of themselves, not only physically, but mentally. Another trend which is incredibly interesting is that the pendulum did not swing all the way back. So everything was locked down. And even though things have opened up, people are still trying to figure out what they feel comfortable with what their comfort zone is, and they call this the socialization paradox. So uh, maybe I don't want to go out to that restaurant. You know, you probably have friends, oh, maybe I'm not that comfortable, or maybe somebody was very social before, and they're not doing that. Everybody's trying to figure out what their comfort level is of getting back out into the world. And so that dovetails with 
this Amazon effect. You may have heard that term before, which is about hyper-personalization. So I'll go on a slight little uh, retail story here about the Amazon effect. I don't know if anybody has had an opportunity to go into a store where there's no till. And it, I mean, I honestly tell you, it feels like you're stealing. Uh, there's just no other way. You go in, you scan your phone, you walk around the convenience store, and you just walk out. That's the trend that's coming in retail because it's frictionless. What consumers are looking for is how do you make, how is a company making it easier for me to, to get the things that I want in the way that I want them? And nobody, I mean, we just saw this at the airport, nobody wants to queue up for a very long period of time to get along their way. So be on the lookout for trends around this idea of personalization. If you go shopping if you, and all of a sudden you have recommendations, that's an example of personalization and it's only going to increase over time. The other thing of backup planners, I would say of any trend, everybody in this room is a backup planner. So you thought you were going to do one thing, whoops, that didn't work out. All right, well, let me call this other supplier. Oh, that didn't work out. We're going to go to plan F. And that's what consumers are doing, too. Particularly as the economy starts to change, people need to start to make adjustments in what they buy and the size of things that they buy and the brands that they buy. And then climate changers. There's always been climate changers. And I, I, I hate to walk in this room and do this, but there is a new carb lifestyle out there, a low carb lifestyle out there, but it's called the low carbon lifestyle. I was flying an American and they gave me an opportunity to offset my carbon credits. We've had calls into the office about these, these little PLU stickers, so innocent, but all of a sudden now you can't compost these and people are concerned, so we're doing some research because people at a very personal level are thinking about what they can do to make a positive impact on the world. Another trend that dovetails is, remember I talked about the friend who was in the city and then she went to the suburb? But her expectations are the same. She doesn't want to have to drive everywhere. She wants the convenience of city life. And people in the city want the beauty of, of, extra, of rural life. And so those are the rural urbanites. So it used to be that if you wanted to compost, you had to have a lot of space. Yeah, maybe you had a farm. But there's innovation like this this, this Lomi, where you can actually, in a couple of hours, put your waste on your kitchen counter, it doesn't matter how small your apartment is, so you can start to compost. Because emotionally and psychologically, these are the types of things that every consumer is looking to do. So you've been a great audience, but I know some of you are like, okay, Lauren, that's great, but what does this have to do with the potato? And I'm gonna show you how you can take some of those insights and tie it to your business. So for example, that self-love seekers, you can position the potato as leaning into comfort. The potato is, is a great, healthy product, but it's also a comfort food. So that's how you can position it. How about the, the climate changers? Instead of talking about eating the potato skin for health, talk about it as no waste. And finally, for the backup planners, tout the versatility. You buy potatoes for your house, it doesn't matter who's eating it, what you're eating with it, it's going to be able to be used in a, in, a, in a variety of ways. So the last thing I want to talk about in the changing world, and mark your calendars, because you could say you, you heard it here, and even though you're going to say, okay, this may be crazy, is the metaverse. And we're dealing with some very acute things right now, but on the horizon, is the metaverse, and it's more than just your kids going in their room with their headphones you know, playing video games. I asked a woman in the office who is extremely well-read and very progressive, okay, I'm going to this conference here, I have to try to explain what the metaverse is. And she said, I can't even explain it to you, and she's a talker, I can't explain it to you. She says, it's a parallel, right now we're in the stone age of the metaverse development, and it's like a parallel universe. And at some point, you're going to have your life here, but you're also going to have your life in the metaverse. And it's where people connect and where brands interact. You're already seeing it now. What this is going to be, I'm not sure. 
But what I am sure is we're doing a lot of work to make sure that the produce industry is relevant in the metaverse just as much as it needs to be in the world we are in today. So there's a lot going on in the changing world of the potato. There's a lot going on in the world. And I had a member that gave me an opportunity to dial in, again from my kitchen, into the World Economic Forum. It was the first time I had an opportunity to participate in the, in the panel group discussion. And it was, it was fabulous. You could see the room, and it was, in my mind, it was like Cannes or the Oscars, and it just seemed like fabulous people from all over the world who were so smart, talking about fabulous things. And the thing that struck me the most was the CEO from the World Farmer Organization, Dr. Theo. And in spite of all of this that's happening in the room, he said, every one of us on Earth used to be farmers. Everyone used to be farmers. And now there are people who are doctors and nurses and engineers. And that's only because they don't have to worry about growing their food. Because there were a few of us that decided to stay behind and take care of it for the world. And it's true. And you are those people who have made that decision to grow the food for the world, despite all the difficulties and all the challenges and all the changes that will come. And I've spoken to a lot of members and a lot of people in the supply chain, and particularly a lot of growers. And there's, sometimes there's no rational reason why, other than the love of what you do, the care for the land, the excitement of the innovation, the chase of the market, but probably most important, the future of the world. And you know what? That will never change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren, for that profound experience of, of things to come. Mind you, I'm, I'm not so sure I'm ever going to be able to cope with being here and there at the same time. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a tough enough without that. Okay, we'll move on to the last speaker today in our uh, plenary session. And, uh, you know, for most people here, you will be very aware that the potato is a source of carbohydrate, but it's not just a source of carbohydrate, and in particular for humans. So we're delighted that we have Katrin Beals from the University of Utah in the US to outline just how good a source of fuel the potato is for people and for athletes. Katrin. told me I had to stand in front of the podium, which is always difficult when you're short. So I'll do my best. Hopefully it's not just a bobbing head that you see. Well, I want to thank the World Potato Congress for inviting me. And I want to thank all of you for staying to the bitter end to hear me speak. Um, I'm a sports dietitian, so my life revolves around providing nutrition recommendations for athletes. So I'm very passionate about nutrition as it pertains to athletes. And I'm really excited to share with you um, probably some of the most recent research surrounding the role of potatoes as a fuel for athletic performance. So people often wonder, what makes a great athlete? And there are two factors that go into making a great athlete. The first is genetics. Much of what goes into making a great athlete is genetically determined. Things like VO2 max, which determine endurance performance, muscle fiber type, which is super important for strength performance. Um, a good bit of our physiology, our body shape and body structure and size all have a strong genetic determination. And we can't change our genetics. So most athletes focus on the part that we can change, which is training. 
And typically when we think of training, we tend to think of the physical aspect of training, going to the gym, getting out on the field, getting out on the road. But I would argue that nutrition is just as important in the overall training of the athlete as the physical training. In fact, I would say that nutrition is more important because you can't train optimally without fueling properly. So when we think of nutrition, we think of food, and food provides nutrients. Nutrients perform three functions as they relate to exercise. The first is providing energy, that is calories. The second is regulating metabolic processes. And the third function that nutrients perform is building and repairing body tissues. The nutrients in potatoes aid in all three of these functions, as I intend to show you on the next several slides. So potatoes are perfectly positioned to be an ideal performance food. Potatoes provide a multitude of nutritional benefits as it relates to athletic performance. And this graphic, which was created by Potatoes USA, highlights some of the key nutritional benefits of potatoes when it comes to exercise and athletic performance. So I'm gonna spend the rest of this presentation talking about each one in a little more detail. Starting, of course, with carbohydrates. Because when it comes to athletic performance, carbohydrate is the most important fuel. Carbohydrates should make up the majority of an athlete's diet. In the world of nutrition, we talk about nutrition recommendations in terms of grams per kilogram of body weight, so relative to body weight. So for the strength or power athlete, they require five to seven grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Athletes that engage in team sports, such as basketball, football, or soccer here in the US, um, as well as things like hockey, both field hockey and ice hockey, they require six to eight grams per kilogram of body weight. And endurance athletes, which have the highest training volume and tend to expend the largest number of calories and need the most carbohydrate, they're at the high end at eight to 12 grams per kilogram of body weight. Just as important to the total amount of carbohydrate that the athlete consumes in a day is the timing of that carbohydrate around their exercise. So it's important to consume carbohydrate before, during, and after exercise to ensure optimal carbohydrate availability. Before exercise, we wanna consume carbohydrate to top off glycogen stores. It can help settle our stomach for those athletes that have a nervous stomach. It will delay fatigue and improve performance. The recommendation is one to four grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight in the one to four hours before exercise. And there's a little rule of thumb, and it goes like this. One hour before exercise, you have one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. Two hours before exercise, two grams per kilogram. Anyone want to guess three hours before exercise? Very good. I'm a professor. Like I say, I have to teach. Um, exactly. And then four hours before, you have four grams per kilogram of body weight. During exercise, carbohydrate provides glucose which will help maintain our muscle and liver glycogen stores. This will help delay fatigue and improve performance. And the recommendation is about 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. And it should be evenly spaced over regular doses. And then after exercise, carbohydrate is important for replenishing those glycogen stores that were used during exercise. This will help prepare the athlete for their next training bout or competition. And the recommendation is about one to 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight in per hour for four hours. Now, there have been a couple of studies which have specifically examined the role of potatoes for providing carbohydrate in the peri-exercise period. That's what we call the pre, during, and post. And I'm gonna talk about those, but first I wanna say that potatoes fit perfectly into this pre, during, and post exercise recommendations. A medium-sized 5.3 ounce or 140 gram potato contains 26 grams of quality carbohydrate. 
It's very versatile, so it can be prepared in a number of different ways. And most importantly for the athlete, it's very digestible. So it's readily digested, readily absorbed, and readily replenishes glycogen stores. A somewhat unknown fact is that potatoes are about 80% water. And fluid is a very important nutrient for athletes as well. So consuming potatoes during exercise and post-exercise will help with fluid consumption. Now on to those studies that I talked about. The first study examined the role of potato consumption during exercise. This study was actually conducted in the laboratory of one of my former students. So very proud professor moment. So this study compared the ingestion of a potato puree versus a commercial carbohydrate gel, along with water, which was the control group, during prolonged cycling on subsequent time trial performance. The subjects included 12 competitive cyclists. There were nine male and three female cyclists. And as I mentioned, the nutritional intervention included water, which was the control, uh, a commercial gel, which happened to be a power bar gel, and then a potato puree. The subjects did a two-hour steady state ride at about 60 to 80 percent of VO2 max, so moderate intensity level. And during that two-hour ride, they received either the carbohydrate gel or the potato puree at 15 grams per dose for a total of 122 grams over the two hours, which roughly equated to 60 grams per hour, which is the recommendation. After the two hour steady state ride, the subjects then were asked to complete a time trial. So they were told to ride the equivalent of a 10 mile ride, this was on a stationary bike, as fast as they possibly could. And what did the results show? Well, time trial performance was significantly faster with the gel and the potato puree. And most importantly, there was no difference in time trial performance between the gel and the potato puree. And which is my pointer? The green light? OK, good. Okay. All right, so this is what this slide shows. So potato gel had similar time trial performance, and both were better than water. The only downside with this study was that the subjects did report a greater GI distress with the potato puree. And that was likely due to the fact that the total volume of potato puree consumed was larger than the gel because they had to match the conditions for carbohydrate content. And to get the same carbohydrate content in the potato puree as the concentrated sugar gel, they had to have a greater volume. So we're looking at about a hundred and or I'm sorry, 1,280 grams of potato puree versus 186 grams of gel. So that's probably why that happened. Um, all right, oops. So um, this study examined the role of potatoes in the post-exercise fueling period. Specifically, it compared potato-based recovery meals to meals comprised largely of various different sports foods. And they looked at glycogen recovery and then subsequent exercise performance. And it was a randomized crossover design. The subjects were 16 recreationally active men and women. And what they did is they completed a 90-minute glycogen depletion ride. So they rode at a steady state for 90 minutes to deplete their glycogen. And then, they rested for four hours, and during that four-hour period, they were provided with either carbohydrate-based or potato-based meals or sports food-based meals. And just for fun, I put the menus up here so you can see what they included. They were given 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight of carbohydrate over for twice for every two hours. At the end of the four-hour rest period and glycogen replenishment period, they de then did a 20-kilometer time trial. So again, ride 20 kilometers as fast as you can. What did the results show? There was no significant difference between either the potato meals or the carbohydrate supplement meals 
on glycogen resynthesis. So potato-based meals were able to resynthesize glycogen just as well as the sports supplements. And time trial performance was not different between the conditions. Most importantly, the subjects rated the potato meals as way better than, <laughs> way better than the sports supplements. They said they were more satiating, more appetizing, more palatable, and they suffered less GI distress. So maybe it's best to consume our potatoes after exercise. So protein is a, another important nutrient for athletic performance, especially for athletes that engage in strength or resistance training type programs. For the strength athlete, protein will help support muscle protein synthesis. It helps support tissue repair. For the endurance athlete, there's evidence to suggest that consuming carbohydrate along with protein will help with glycogen resynthesis. And also, protein will help with tissue repair. A medium 5.3 ounce, 140 gram potato provides three grams of protein. Most importantly, it is a complete protein, meaning that it contains all nine essential amino acids. And just to refresh your memory, if it's been a while since you've had a nutrition class, the essential amino acids are those amino acids that our bodies can't synthesize, so we have to get in our diet. It also has a high biological value. And biological value is a measure of the efficiency of a protein to support growth and maintenance of body tissues. The slide or the graph here shows the biological value of potatoes relative to eggs, so slightly lower than eggs, but still stacks up pretty well, and better than soybeans and dried beans. This study sort of proves the points that I made on the last slide. And it examined the total protein, essential amino acid content, and amino acid composition of a large selection of plant-based protein sources compared to animal-based proteins, as well as human skeletal muscle. The researchers isolated and analyzed 10 milligram portions of 35 different proteins, including potato protein. And the results are shown in these different diagrams. So I wanna take you through them fairly quickly, but I think it's important to see the raw data. So if we look at the top diagram right here, this is mean protein content as a percent of raw material. And I've circled potatoes in red. So what you can see is that potatoes stacked up very nicely and ranked very well um, compared to both the animal-based proteins and met or exceeded the amount of total protein compared to other plant-based proteins. This diagram here highlights the essential amino acid content as a percent of total protein. What you can see here is that potatoes beat all the other plant proteins when it came to essential amino acid content. And while it was slightly lower than some of the animal-based proteins, it matched up very nicely to casein, which is a milk protein, and egg protein. The last diagram highlights the branch chain amino acid content as a percent of total protein. Branch chain amino acids are important, especially for athletes, because they are predominantly metabolized by the muscle. And of the branch chain amino acids, leucine is probably the most important, and that's the graph at the top. Leucine is a key essential amino acid for two reasons. One, it's a primary constituent of muscle tissue. Number two, it's a regulator of muscle protein synthesis. So leucine actually activates muscle protein synthesis in skeletal muscle, something athletes are really interested in. And what you notice here, I should have circled the little, the, in little here, but potato beat them all in leucine. Of course, this study only looked at the amount of protein and essential amino acids in potatoes. What we really want to know is if potato protein can actually support muscle protein synthesis. And that's what this study did. 
Now I'm giving you a sneak peek into a study that hasn't even been published yet. I could probably get into trouble for showing this to you, but the results are so exciting that I just wanted to share it, so don't tell anybody, All right? So um, this study compared muscle protein synthesis rates following the ingestion of 30 grams of potato protein versus 30 grams of milk protein. And they evaluated this at rest and during recovery from a single bout of resistance exercise. So there were 24 recreationally active young men that acted as the subjects. The exercise intervention included leg press and knee extension. They did three sets of 80% of their one rep max of leg press, followed by one set to failure. Same thing with knee extensions. Immediately after the exercise, they consumed either the 30 grams of potato protein or the 30 grams of milk protein. And then they rested or they sat for five hours, during which time they took muscle biopsies to measure glycogen, uh, I'm sorry, to measure muscle protein, muscle protein synthesis rates. What did the results show? Potato protein was similar to milk protein in its ability to increase muscle protein synthesis, both at rest, which, oops, sorry, went the wrong way, both at rest, which is demonstrated here, and during exercise. So you've got potatoes in the black bar and milk in the white. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the important micronutrients, that is vitamins and minerals in potatoes, starting with potassium. As a key intracellular electrolyte, potassium plays critical roles in regulating the intracellular fluid compartment, as well as regulating muscle contraction, and that includes cardiac muscle, that is the heart muscle. It's also highly involved in nerve transmission. Like sodium, potassium is lost in sweat, and therefore potassium must be replaced post-exercise. Potatoes are a good source of potassium, 620 milligrams in a 5.3 ounce, 140 gram potato, which is 13% of the US daily value. And as I'm sure you all know, even though bananas get the primary billing as a potassium containing food, potatoes actually exceed bananas when it comes to potassium. Vitamin C has a number of important functions that can be directly and indirectly related to exercise, including collagen formation, bone formation, fat metabolism, immune function, and it is a very powerful antioxidant. Research shows that athletes who are insufficient or deficient in vitamin C do have compromised performance. Studies also show that supplementing with vitamin C, so high doses of vitamin C supplements, does not improve athletic performance and may actually impair it. Conversely, the research indicates that diets that are rich in vitamin C from foods do support optimal performance. And of course, potatoes are an excellent source of vitamin C providing 27 milligrams of vitamin C. One of the presentations a little earlier today talked about the importance of iron. And while I don't have it listed here, I do want to mention that iron is the nutrient that is most often deficient in the diets of athletes. And athletes are at high risk for, being, for suffering anemia. Potatoes not only contain iron, but they contain a highly bioavailable source of iron because of the vitamin C in the potato. Last but not least, vitamin B6. This B vitamin plays critical roles in both carbohydrate and protein metabolism. It is a cofactor for key enzymes in energy metabolism. In addition, it's involved in amino acid synthesis and uh, breakdown, so in protein turnover. And finally, it's important for heme synthesis. And heme is a key component of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the molecule that carries oxygen to the tissues and removes carbon dioxide. So very important in exercise. Potatoes are a good source of B6. A 5.3 ounce 
140 gram potato provides 10% of the U.S. daily value, which is about 0.11 milligrams of vitamin B6. So, to sum up, potatoes are a nutrient-dense vegetable that provide the energy, protein, carbohydrate, potassium, vitamin C, and B vitamins you need to perform at your best. They're highly versatile. They can be prepared in a number of different ways to suit all sorts of diets. They're readily digestible, which is very important from an athletic standpoint, and they're very palatable. And I want to thank you for your attention. And with that, I'll say goodbye. Catherine, thank you very much for that. And I would say not only did you stay within your time, you probably went close to beating it. Uh, I, I must confess, as, a, as a, a, an interested spectator from the floor, uh, I was deadly curious when you mentioned measuring the activity of the recreational act, what was it? recreationally active young men. I was wondering what they were getting up to, but you did go on to explain it. Well done. Thank you very much. Um, OK, do we have a guest on video? Okay, we're, we're trying now to uh, make a link straight with Tom Skewens, who is a professional cyclist. I haven't spoken to Tom before. Uh, it'll be a first time, and it, I, I guess we learn some little bit. Tom, is that yourself that's there? Yep. I'm Andy Tom, Andy Doyle. You're very welcome to the uh, World Potato Congress here in Dublin, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, Tom, can I begin by asking you uh, where in the world you are at this point in time? I am actually currently in Girona, Spain, uh, which is great training grounds for cycling. And I'm guessing that involves going up hills and down hills and having all kinds of endurance tested? Very much so, yes. Uh, Tom, would you just give us a, a quick feel for what being a professional cyclist means in terms of effort, endurance, etc. cetera. Uh, we, we've just heard, and I, I think you may have been listening in to the presentation from Katrin. Uh, did you manage to listen into that? Okay, yes. so she was talking about the, the great advantages of the potato uh, in terms of being a fuel. And you are not just a cyclist, you're a cyclist that has become a potato ambassador. And therefore, I assume that potatoes are a big part of the fuel of your business. Yeah, I mean, um, as a cyclist, you, like uh, Catherine mentioned before, uh, we are in the big endurance spectrum of sport. So we do require a lot of calories to keep us going. And uh, for sure, potatoes are one of those uh, calories that I consume. Uh, for example, last week, I had uh, more than 30 hours spent on the bike, um, which obviously is just the riding time. Uh, obviously, there's more time than just riding included in training. But uh, yeah, in, uh, in those 30 hours, I burned uh, more than 24,000 calories, which is a lot of potatoes. I, I would say that sounds like a lot of potatoes. When Catherine was speaking, she talked about packing in a kilo of potato paste, and I think you'd want to have a reasonably big tank to, to hold it. But when I'm watching all of you guys on bikes, uh, you certainly don't have big tanks like the rest of us or fellas like me. I mean, the, the, the reason is because we do 30 hours a week or more or less, and uh, that tank gets emptied very fast. Even though we fill it up quick, we also empty it very, very fast. <laughs> That's a reasonable explanation, in fairness, Tom. Um, Tom, you're within the sport of cycling, you're called the potato man. Can you explain to us and to the audience why that is? Yeah, um, it begin, began a few years ago, uh, but really the biggest reason is because uh, I was at that time visiting, or not visiting, racing in America. And um, 
one of our uh, staff members was asking me what um, what are there any jokes about Latvians, and uh, I was like, I actually don't know, but uh, of course he googled it, and most of the jokes were about Latvians and potatoes, and then he started telling me the jokes, and I was like, I mean, but you got to be you got to be honest. The potato is the most versatile vegetable out there. It can do everything. It can you can have fries, you can have chips, you can have mash, you can have uh, boiled, baked, whatever, and it can even light up a light bulb. Show me a vegetable can that can do that, and then we can argue again. Tom, in, in answering that question, you've you've answered a question that I was about to ask, which was what nationality you were. You said you're Latvian. Uh, it, it, are the potato or are potatoes an important part of the ordinary person's diet in Latvia? It, it really is. I mean, um, as I think everyone here knows, it's very easy to uh, grow potatoes uh, in a big, big part of the world. And Latvia is, of course, one of it. And everyone in Latvia has a garden or has a neighbor with a garden. So everyone has always grown potatoes and ducks. There are very, very many dishes uh, in Latvian cuisine that involve potatoes, starting with potato pancakes and uh, ending up with potato desserts. Uh, so it's always been, yeah, a huge, uh, huge part in uh, Latvian cuisine and in my upbringing, for sure. Okay, uh, and Tom, I'm going to ask you a more of a professional question now in terms of being a cyclist and training and uh, just for, for those of us that maybe ride a bike to get from A to B, which is very different to what you do. You know, wh what is, you, you've mentioned how many hours you spend on a bike, but just give us the idea of, or an idea of a standard stage length in terms of, of distance, in terms of time and hours, pre-preparation, uh, recovery afterwards, etc. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, one-day races and stage races, of course. Uh, so one-day races are one day. Stage races can be anywhere from two days to, um, people might know, the, the Giro, the Tour de France, and the Vuelta are 21 days. Um, it is not 21 days in a row of racing, but it is 21 days with two rest days. So uh, usually you have nine days of racing, then one rest day, then six days, one rest day, and another six. Um, and the stages are can be anywhere in between 10 kilometers, which would probably be just the uh, individual time trial or prologue. But uh, yeah, we also have uh, stages that are more than 200 kilometers long. Uh, one of the longest races in the world, or actually the longest races in the world, is almost 300 kilometers, where we ride from Milan in Italy to San Remo in Italy. Uh, and uh, yeah, those uh, long days take uh, seven hours, sometimes more. Crikey. I, I, there, was, there was a few groans this morning when the, I heard a few people went on a 2K. I don't know whether it was a run or a walk, but I know I wasn't there for health reasons. And that was my health reasons. Um, uh, again, Tom, being, being so active, uh, in, in actively involved with potato promotion, uh, etc., have you managed to convince others in your team or others in the peloton that the potato is a supreme food to fuel the effort that's involved? Uh, I mean, there's definitely more potatoes in, the, in our menu when I'm at races. Uh, we are very fortunate that we travel with the chef to the big races. And the chefs know that when I'm there, there's uh, at least the one side is potatoes uh, pretty much at every dinner. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, uh, it's hard to change people's uh, routines. But at the same time, yeah, there's definitely more potato involved. And actually, at uh, one edition of the Tour de France, uh, People brought me potato bags uh, to the start line occasionally in turn for some souvenirs. Very good, very good. And I'm guessing, uh, Tom, that people that come like that would also be like to be at the end, waving you in first at the end of the stage, etc. as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, sometimes they get lucky and they get to see the start and the finish. Sometimes, uh, unfortunately, it's just the start because the finish is so far away that it's hard to 
hard to beat the peloton there. Tom, look at you. You're speaking as as a as a, a cyclist, but nonetheless a professional athlete. Uh, do you believe, from your experience, from your knowledge of controlling diet, that potatoes should be a bigger feature in the in the, the fueling of other sportsmen in many other disciplines, team sports, endurance sports, etc. Um, I was actually really impressed with. Uh, the research that Catherine was showing and uh, it uh, I hadn't heard all of it I had heard of some research here and there and I think that's a really good step in convincing more and more athletes to consider potatoes uh, but I most definitely believe that there is a big part where potatoes can be very beneficial because rice and pasta get quite old uh, which is currently the main source, at least for most of the endurance athletes, as a carbohydrate. And they're very bland. Of course, there's days when rice will trump uh, potato just because it is, uh, there's just less weight associated with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's a huge benefit in actually having potatoes also as a performance food. Tom, we're just at the end. You're training for the Tour de France at the moment, I'm guessing. Do you think you'll make the cut? I hope so. Uh, big race coming up uh, actually starting this Sunday uh, in, in France, a eight-day stage race called Criterium du Dauphiné. And uh, that's kind of my final preparation for the Tour. We'll see how well I've done my homework uh, now for the last three weeks while being at home and how well I stack up to the, yeah, to the rest of the guys. But uh, in my team, I feel confident enough that uh, they will pick the best riders. And uh, I feel like I've done enough uh, at home that uh, I'll be there on the start line. Well, Toms, you have, a, you have a lot of people here today that will maybe for the first time be watching and shouting for an individual if you're there in your glorious colors. And perhaps if you can cross the, this, a stage line first in your interview, you will unquestionably, I would have said, mention the power of the potato in getting you there. Yeah. And we wish you the very oh. best of luck in that. Go ahead, you're going Thank to do you. something yeah. there. We, we made shirts a few <laughs> years ago with potato power and uh, these been <clears throat> this is actually from 2020 when uh, we were stuck indoors and on the back there's um, me a, a char character of me on a stationary bike pedaling with instead of a carrot dangling in front of me a potato dangling in front of me <laughs> Tom's, I guess I could stay going for at least another half an hour on the interview, but time is against us because they've done a bad job so far. So time, time will always beat us. But can I thank you on behalf of the audience here in Dublin for taking the time to engage with us uh, in, for this important Congress. And we wish you the very best of luck in your career and in every stage of every race. Thank you, Tom's. My pleasure. Okay, we have one other uh, unit of business to attend to, but just before we do that, uh, can I just remind people that the uh, barbecue is on uh, later tonight in the Claydon Ballsbridge Hotel, which is out the gate and down the road to the traffic lights. There are two hotels down there. You won't get too much for free in one of them. Go to the one with the red brick building. Um, and tomorrow, we're back here at 830 uh, just another note for tomorrow, for anybody that's going to room four, if you knew where room four was today, it won't be there tomorrow. Um, it's moving location to the uh, Minerva room, and we can give you more information on that in the morning, but just to be aware of it. Uh, two other very quick uh, things to say, and one is to load the app onto your phones because it, it enables the organizers to tell you what's going on, or if you're lost, that maybe it'll even bring you home. I'm not sure. And then the other one is to remind you again that when you're waiting to go down to the barbecue, that the posters are upstairs in the exhibition hall. So my last duty of today is to call on uh, Thomas Houlihan. Thomas, I can't see where you are, but you're there somewhere, uh, to uh, organize 
some uh, WPC awards uh, for uh, deserving winners. And Thomas, uh, Thomas, over to you for the remainder. And thank you. Thanks to all my speakers also, and thanks to you, the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Andy. So an Irishman was late getting to a very important awards presentation at the Royal Dublin Society, and he was circling the building and circling. He couldn't find a parking spot, and he was getting more and more frustrated and later and later, and finally he just stopped in traffic, and he said, Lord, I will give up Jameson. I will give up Guinness. I will go to Mass every Sunday if you just give me a parking spot. And like that, the clouds parted, the sun shined down, and illuminated the perfect parking spot right in front of the building. And so the Irishman said, never mind, Lord, I found one. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the World Potato Congress Industry Awards Program. My name is Tamas Houlihan, and I serve as the executive director of the Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association across the pond. These awards honor lifetime achievement in the international potato industry. Our first award winner is Dr. John Burke. Dr. Burke is one of Ireland's foremost experts in the area of potato agronomy. In the 1990s, John returned to study to undertake a PhD entitled The Effect of Seed Source, Physiological Age, and Desiccation Date on Yield and Chip Color in a Range of Potato Cultivars. John retired from TGASC, which is Ireland's Agriculture and Food Development Authority, in 2007, having worked also on cereal disease control. In retirement, he returned to his favorite crop to volunteer with VITA, an Irish NGO working primarily in Ethiopia and Eritrea on potato development projects. He worked tirelessly to maximize the impact of potato, always with a focus on developing farmers' capabilities and knowledge. He spearheaded local seed production on virgin community land in Chencha, Ethiopia, to prevent the spread of bacterial wilt, and pioneered the production of seed potatoes in mountainous regions in Eritrea to prevent viral degeneration. John has led many workshops and seminars for farmers, agronomists, regulators, and extension staff in both countries. He is instantly recognized and held in high esteem by all from farmers to ministers due to his easy, respectful nature, genuine interest in everyone he meets, and his natural desire to impart and share knowledge. During extensive visits providing seminars and workshops with farmers and extension personnel, John became acutely aware of the lack of quality teaching material. He wrote a book in 2017 entitled Growing the Potato Crop, targeted as a frontline resource for extension personnel in developing countries. The book was published with sponsorship from the Irish potato industry and made available free of charge to all in developing countries. Growing the potato crop has since been translated into several languages and an abridged handbook has also been developed. The book is also available as a free online resource and as a PDF. His visits to Ethiopia and Eritrea are highly anticipated and John is held in high esteem by all who have met him and learned from him. John also actively supports the research of several PhD and MS students working on potato development topics. We are pleased to present the 11th World Potato Congress Industry Award to Dr. John J. Burke. Okay, I've been told that I'm allowed one minute, so <laughs> very quickly. Um, thank you very much to the World uh, Potato Conference for the award I'm receiving this evening. Um, I know it's an individual award, but I would prefer to think of it, I, I've always worked as part of a team, and I would prefer to believe it as an acknowledgement of team support. During the toughest years, I was surrounded by fellow researchers, 
by technical staff and farm staff. And they would support, encourage, and even criticize you. And all of that is essential. I say a special word of thanks to John Weekly and the VITA organization in Dublin for the invitation to become involved in the potato project in East Africa. I had wonderful days out there. I would think it would say, definitely say it was a life enhancing experience for me. And some of the best days of my life were spent in East Africa. In uh, Ethiopia, again, Vita have a wonderful team and we have the support as well of the Ministry of Agriculture and even people from the, Ethi or from the Ethiopian Institute of Agricultural Research. Similarly in Eritrea, again, you know, we have close contact with Minister Arafaini. Uh, every time we go out, we get the opportunity to meet with him, and that's a huge uh, step. Again, you know, it's, it's wonderful to work with good colleagues out there, and re I really enjoy the visits. Finally, I, on a day like this, you should never mention names because as sure as you're going to forget one. However, I'd ask you to forgive me. I'm going to mention one name, and that's the name of John O'Shea. John, his family, and the Irish Potato Federation enthusiastically supported the project in Ethiopia. John, one thing that was precious in his life was time, but nonetheless, he took the time. He went out there to see what had to be done, followed up with visits. So he gave generously of his time. So sadly, John is no longer with us. Finally, I'd say thank you very much again to everyone who helped me in life, all the people who I've worked with and shared with. Uh, thank you for making this uh, reward possible this evening. Thank you very much. Our next award goes to Dick Okray. Richard W. Dick Okray was born in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, the son of Joseph and Patricia Okray. He attended school in Stevens Point and graduated in 1977 from Pacelli High School. In 1981, he taught English in Cali, Columbia, and in 1982, he graduated from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point with BA degrees in economics and Spanish. He was employed from 1982 to 2020 at Oak Ray Family Farms in Plover, growing 7,750 acres of quality row crops in central Wisconsin, specializing in fresh channel potatoes. The farm was started by his family over 110 years ago. His most recent position title was President and Sales. Following his retirement in 2020, he remains a co-owner of the family farm, which won a National Environmental Stewardship Award for its outstanding achievement in the area of pesticide risk reduction. The international potato industry has benefited greatly from the leadership of Dick Okray. He served on the executive committee of the U.S. Potato Board, now known as Potatoes USA, and has served as a potato industry ambassador from the United States attending multiple World Potato Congress events in China, Scotland, New Zealand, and Peru. He and his wife, Carol, were instrumental in helping raise funds to build multiple wells in impoverished villages near Cameroon, Africa. They established a Weller's Walk event in Stevens Point, with participants filling and carrying large water jugs to a central location, raising awareness of the trek many villagers in Africa make daily just to gather enough water for their family's needs. Funds raised from the annual event were used to construct wells in areas around rural Cameroon, greatly improving the lives of thousands of villagers. Active in his community and his industry, Dick has served on numerous organizations and boards, including the Wisconsin Migrant Labor Council, Central Wisconsin Economic Development Corp., United Potato Growers of Wisconsin, and the United Potato Growers of America. Dick is also widely respected and admired for his philanthropic efforts, serving on the board of directors of the St. Michael's Hospital Foundation, 
the Edward J. Okre Charitable Foundation, and recently the Farming for the Future Foundation. Dick served two terms, including one as chairman of the International Committee for the U.S. Potato Board. He also served on the Wisconsin Potato Industry Board from 2015 to 2020 and held the position of vice president. He received the WPVGA's Agri-Communicator Award, the Portage County Business Council's Outstanding Contribution to Agriculture Award, and the prestigious University of Wisconsin Stevens Point Distinguished Alumni Award. In 2020, he was inducted into the Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association Hall of Fame. Dick has been married to Carol for 38 years. They have three adult children, Xerxes, Hannah, and Max. A marvelous entertainer, Dick enjoys performing music and magic. In addition to golf and travel, he lists his hobbies as reading, learning, and growing. We are pleased to present the 11th World Potato Congress Industry Award to Dick Okray. Uh, we have a co-worker of Dick's, a cousin, Mark Finnessy, who will accept the award on behalf of Dick, who apparently isn't feeling well. Our next award goes to Paul Struick. Paul C. Struick has been a professor of crop physiology at Wageningen University since 1986. He was the youngest ever appointed professor in Wageningen at that time, and potato has been the main focus over his career. He has conducted research on physiology, seed production, QTL-based modeling of crop growth and quality, seed system and chain management of agricultural produce in Africa, and sustainable intensification. Many of his research projects are interdisciplinary in nature and in close collaboration with social scientists, bridging the gap between potato agronomy and development outcomes. Paul has been editor-in-chief of Potato Research, the journal of the European Association for Potato Research, since 1990, and a member of the EAPR board in various roles over the same period. He is co-author of more than 500 scientific papers in international journals, including the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and a Nature Plants paper, and six papers in Trends in Plant Science. Other outputs include more than 300 scientific papers or papers for the general public, and 15 books, including Seed Potato Technology. He has completed the supervision of more than 110 PhD candidates, and is currently supervising 30 PhD students, many of them working abroad. In 2019, Professor Struick received the International Crop Science Award from the Crop Science Society of America for his contributions to crop science. He is also program committee chair and vice chair of the board of trustees of the consultative group on International Agricultural Research Institute, ICARTA, the International Center for Agriculture Research in the Dry Areas. In addition, he maintains a busy teaching schedule in Wageningen with many modules related to potato agronomy for the next generation of potato professionals. We are pleased to present the 11th World Potato Congress Industry Award to Paul C. Struick. And I am not sure if he made it. Is he here? Yes, he's here. It's a great honor for me to, to be a recipient of this uh, very outstanding uh, award of the uh, World Potato Congress uh, Industry. Uh, working on potatoes is really a 
marvelous. I mean, um, you, you can go to all places in the world because potato is grown almost everywhere, except uh, for uh, Antarctica, uh, at least at this point in time. And um, I've been mainly interested in, in seed systems. And when you work on seed systems, you really uh, can start to, to get acquainted to all aspects of uh, potato uh, production, and uh, including all the social science uh, aspects of it. And for me, it always has been a great challenge to, to try to, to link into the knowledge system of, of the farmers and try to connect with that knowledge system uh, with what I know and uh, go into a sort of joint learning experience to, to understand more about why farmers grow potatoes in the way that they do that. And I re really learned much more uh, from farmers than from many of my uh, colleague uh, scientists. Uh, and uh, I'm sure they also say uh, the same thing about, about me. Uh, so um, it's a, a great honor to have received uh, this, this award and I would like to thank you all very much. Thank you. Our final award goes to Antun Wallace. After his studies as a civil engineer, Antun Wallace, together with his business companion and agronomist Luc Reyes, created the Belgian potato processing factory Agristo in Holsta Harlbeck. Both Antun and Luc were sons of farmers, and their spouses were active in the administration department of the company, making it a real family business. Since the beginning of his career, he has been active in the Belgian Potato Trade and Processing Association, Belgapom. As chairman of the Environment Group, his role in the development of the Belgian potato industry was one of the most progressive regarding new water purification and reuse technology. He was responsible for the creation of the Flemish Guideline for Best Available Technologies, which became a reference document for the EU potato and vegetable processing industry. As president of Belgapom from 2006 to 2012, he played a crucial role in the development of the Belgian Industry Federation and the professionalization of the European Potato Processors Association, of which he was for a long time an active board member. Antoon was also the first president of Vegaplan, the Belgian food and plant safety scheme, which has over 10,000 farmers certified and achieved the golden status for the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative. His own company, Agristo, evolved to one of the most important Belgian players exporting potato products all over Europe and the world with the development of new production facilities in Tilburg in the Netherlands, Nazareth, and Wielsbeck. In 2018, the children of Antoon and Luc took over all the management functions to become the second generation to lead this unique potato processing company into new times. Antoon is deserving of this WPC Industry Award because of the successful development of his family-run company, Agristo, into a European and global player, and most of all because his engagement within the Belgian and European potato chain and his ability to build bridges between the links and to bring innovation into this great sector. The innovation in water purification and reuse of processed water in Europe carries his shadow as well as the unique food and plant safety scheme, Vegaplan, a system based on a public-private partnership and accessibility for farmers. Antoon was also one of the promoters of the collaboration of Belga Palm with TRIAS, the non-government organization working on potato projects in the Andes. Without Antoon Wallace, the Belgian potato sector would have looked quite different. We are pleased to present the 11th World Potato Congress Industry Award to Antoon Wallace.
Dear uh, potato friends, uh, thank you uh, absolutely for this uh, sign uh, of uh, admiration or appreciation. <clears throat> I'm uh, really pleased uh, with it. And I think as a Belgian processor and for the processing industry in general, we can be proud when we look back to the great steps we have made the last uh, decades in our industry. Great steps on innovation, efficiency, sustainability, and uh, I believe there is still a great future in front of us. The potato certainly can do it. And we have seen nothing yet. So let's believe in the future and the potato. Thank you again. And that concludes our award presentation. Congratulations to our winners. Thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you at the barbecue. We would like the four award winners to come up for one more photo. Me? OK. <laughs> OK. Could you give me a mic real quick? Uh, we need the four award winners to please come back to the stage for a photo. Thank you. <laughs>